You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Hey there, and welcome to episode number 109 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, and on this edition of the podcast, we're going to hear from marketing guru Seth Godin. Seth is an author and thought leader who has written 13 books that cover topics like marketing in the digital age, the spreading of ideas, and leadership. His book, Tribes, was released a few years back and garnered a lot of attention among the music community as it discusses the idea that smart innovators find or assemble a movement of similarly minded individuals or a tribe and get that tribe excited by releasing a new product, music, or a message, usually through the internet. The idea of building a tribe on the internet is something that uh, many in the DIY artist community have been doing and finding a lot of success for their music in uh, this new music economy. And uh, speaking of the music economy, stick around to the end of the podcast where we'll have a special offer from CD Baby for DIY Musician podcast listeners. So you'll want to listen all the way to the end and check out that offer. Well, that's enough for the intro. Let's get to my interview with Seth Godin. Well, joining me on the phone is Seth Godin. He's the author of books like Tribes, Lynchpin, and he has a brand new book called Poke the Box. Seth, how you doing? I'm fabulous. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. From from what I've read about you, you're a, a big music fan, so it's great to have you to, here to chat about uh, the state of the industry and music marketing and all that good stuff. Just uh, thinking about where things are at with the music industry, it's kind of an interesting place. There's constantly bad news about sales and profits, and and yet there's more music out there than ever before, but uh, they just can't seem to make it uh, work for them. Where where did the mainstream music business go wrong? Well, I mean, you've made the key distinction. It's not bad times for music. There's more music made by more people, listened to more often by more listeners than ever. The, the thing that the music industry made a couple of big mistakes. Big mistake number one was uh, being seduced by the bubble that was CD revenue. And if you look at the chart of growth in the music industry from 1960 to 1999, uh, the CD was an anomaly, and the music industry believed it was real and forever. Um, and so they got a bubble that they didn't really uh, deserve, and they believed it would last for a really long time. Uh, the second big shift was they believed that um, their job was to extract maximum profit from scarcity. When the Internet came along and eliminated scarcity, when CD Baby comes along and makes it so that you don't need uh, so many gatekeepers, then uh, the entire underpinning of the industry goes away because abundance is the enemy of a record label. Mm-hmm. So when, when that shift happens and uh, this new breed of independent artists emerges, how, how come the, the mainstream industry just can't embrace that model and, and shift what they're doing and take a look at what's working for the independent artists. Well, it's really important to remember that when people go to get a job, they tend to get a job doing that job. And so when the industry changes, when you work for a big company, it's really hard. You know, why didn't Random House, which is ostensibly in the business of finding information, start Google? Or why didn't Sotheby's uh, do eBay? And the answer is the same, which is the people who work there didn't go get that job because they wanted to work at some scrappy startup that was playing by different rules. They chose that job because they wanted to work in an existing organization doing what was done yesterday because it's more fun. <laughs> we, we've seen something that, that's been great about uh, CD Baby. We've seen all these niche artists that previously couldn't get any sort of audience gain an audience. And, uh, that kind of speaks to what you talk about in your book, Tribes, these people that are able to find a group of people that were normally uh, left outside of the mainstream, but 
they're able to to lead them and gain a following. Right. So you know, so lead, leading doesn't always mean taking over the Wisconsin State House. You know, uh, Keller Williams, who is one of my favorite independent musicians, leads a group of people on a rolling party as it travels around the country. And and you show up at a Keller concert and you'll recognize people who you've seen from other concerts. The vibe is similar. This is your family. These are people you would miss if you didn't get to see them again. And they couldn't go to this party if Keller wasn't there. And so his role, and he understands this, his role is to keep the tribe together and moving forward. And he does this by going in a direction and people who want to follow him, follow him. I know that uh, a lot of the artists that we work with every day are they see that happening, and like I said, we've had a lot of success stories here at CD Baby who, of people who have naturally found those roles. But there seems to be a, a growing number of people that are kind of frustrated and by the fact that they now have to kind of consider marketing a part of their musical efforts and also kind of building grassroots uh, tribes, if you will, and that is now taking over part of the music-making aspect of being a musician. What do you think about people who are struggling with that? I, w- I would really like to encourage them to remember about the tyranny of being picked. And the old model um, was based on the uh, second-grade notion of raising your hand and waiting for someone in power to pick you. And the problem with that is if you get picked, it's great. If you're on Oprah, it's great. If Clive Davis picks you, it's great. But almost no one gets picked. And I think that we should think twice before we wish to go back to the days of needing to get picked. And the alternative is pick yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you pick yourself, then what you have to understand is that comes with a lot of responsibility. And part of that responsibility is figuring out how to bring your message to the world. And I think that's where a lot of artists kind of get frustrated right at that point where you said, figure out how you're going to take your message to the world. How do you go about locating your tribe? I mean, because, you know, there's there's some people that I've seen that just seem to be a natural at it, and other people that are great musicians and get frustrated with the idea that, okay, my music being good isn't good enough anymore. How do? What's the first step they need to take in order to just look around and figure out who their tribe is? Well, let's talk about what it means to be a great musician. Uh, does that mean playing all the notes in the right order? Or does it mean uh, creating a performance that makes someone uh, cry or touches them in some way? Or does it mean uh, putting music into the world that spreads because people can't help but spread it? You know, I think that the first category is the one we need to uh, say not so much anymore. That just because you please a critic or just because you are better than that guy who's already famous does not mean you are a great musician. I think what it means to be a great musician is that there are people in the world who once they hear your work can't get it out of their head. They need more of it and they need to share it. So your job is not to figure out how to fit in enough to get Pitchfork to pick you or to fit in enough to get that crowd at at South by Southwest to pick you. I think the way you become a great musician is you find 10 people who when they're exposed to your work, need more of it and who bring their friends. And then you have 20 people and then you have 50 people and that's how you grow. And if we look at, oh, I don't know, um, the, the woman who wrote Harry Potter or the guy who wrote um, The Tipping Point, you know, these are authors who don't start with huge numbers of people. Now, what happens is you start with a small number of people and those small number of people bring you other people. And that idea is the key. I mean, J.K. Rowling was rejected and rejected and rejected because the gatekeepers thought she wasn't a great writer. But what happened was enough independent bookstores and enough 12-year-olds thought she was a great writer that the word spread. J.K. Rowling doesn't have to go out every single day and harass people. She created great work that spread. So... The, the key is to just focus on a small group and make sure that those people are just completely satisfied and, and 
just blown away by what you're doing that they just want to keep telling other people. Right. And if they're not, then you've got to change one of two things, either the group or your work, right? Mm-hmm. That there's, there are groups of people that I've spoken to over the years as a speaker who don't get me. So I could change who I am or I could go find a new group. And lucky for me, the group that I really want uh, to appeal to is pretty big. But if they weren't, I would probably still be doing the same work. I just wouldn't be popular, and people wouldn't call my work great because it wasn't resonating with people. I know there's a, a lot of talk about uh, the a thousand true fans, and, and a lot of times when it relates to a, a tribe, putting together a tribe. What what exactly is the concept of having a thousand true fans? So Kevin Kelly coined the term, and it's brilliant. And the math goes like this. If you don't have a manager, an agent, a recording studio, hangers-on, and the rest of the Eddie Murphy crowd around you, (laughs) how many people actually do you need to be a professional? How many people need to be out there who will send you 50 bucks a year? Well, it's like a 1,000. If there are 1,000 people who will pay 50 bucks for two CDs or 50 bucks for a couple concert tickets, you're making 50K. That's not rich money, but it's enough. Mm-hmm. It's enough to get you started. And if you get to 10000 now you're making half a million dollars a year. That's a lot. Well, in every single corner of the music industry, 10000 is considered a failure. And so the point here is that maybe you need to think not about Billboard and not about Casey Kasem, but maybe you need to think about whether there are 10,000 people who care enough to send you 50 bucks a year when you send them an email saying the new thing is ready. How do you keep that group of people that engaged with you in this day and age where there's just a glut of bands, a glut of music, and just everybody grabbing their attention? What, what kind of things can an artist do to, to keep people thinking, uh, you know, wanting to participate on that ongoing basis? Well, you know, a key part of it is you need more than 10,000 people. Mm-hmm. You need 100,000 100, semi-true fans before you're going to have 10,000 true fans, right? And this is where the promiscuity comes in. That if, you know, how much should Arcade Fire have charged the listeners on the Grammys to hear them play, right? They charge nothing. Mm-hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Isn't that piracy, right? Well, in fact, they would have gladly paid to be heard by that group of people because that promiscuous behavior of spreading your idea for no money makes it more likely, if the door is clearly marked, that the true fans will go through that door. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways that once you have a true fan, you can figure out uh, a, a codependent relationship where they benefit and you benefit. But first, you got to have true fans. You brought up a, a topic that uh, has been a hot topic on the podcast. We had Chris Anderson on the, the podcast a while back. I don't know if you're familiar with his work and his book, Free. I, I, know, I know him very well. <laughs> um, he, he made perfect sense in his discussion about, you know, giving away something for free in exchange for, you know, like you said, opening the door for uh, the, the fan, the true fan to, to clearly find their way. And yet I, I'm shocked at how many artists were just uh, enraged by the idea. What, what, why do you think it's so hard for people to accept the idea of giving away something free in order to locate like their tribe? You know, this, this is fascinating to me because I don't know anyone. I don't know one successful artist who has followed the free path and said, that was a mistake. I'm successful now. I have lots and lots of fans. I shouldn't have done it. I know all sorts of people who aren't successful at collecting an audience, who refuse to give things away for free, who are angry about it. So it seems to me that the market case here is really clear. Lots and lots of people read my blog. I have no ads on my blog. I don't charge anything to read my blog. I hope more people will read my blog. I'm not complaining. Gary V has put up Hundreds of videos filled with advice that lots of people charge for. He's not complaining, right? That I get the fact that the world would be better if lots of fans knew you were there and paid you every day. That the world would probably be better if, you know, we put a penny a gallon gas on a penny a gallon tax on gasoline and use it to support the next ten thousand artists who need our support. But those things aren't those things aren't happening, right? 
So if those things aren't happening, what you're going to do about it? Well, you can go get a job as an insurance broker, or you can play your music because you have no choice. And if you play your music and you share your music, and if your music is truly great, as we are asserting, then the true fans will find you. And when the true fans find you, a lot of the other stuff takes care of itself. I think a lot of the artists that uh, w- come back with uh, you know, concern about giving away content for free, a lot of them will say, if I'm not, if I'm not selling my music, what am I supposed to sell? And I think that's where they, they feel like, uh, why can't I just make money on the music anymore? Well, wait a second. Let's talk about what they mean by the music. Uh, until 1910, for the first 50,000 years of mankind, the music meant live performance. That's all there was. Mm -hmm. That if you lived in Austria in 1810 and you went to hear a piece of classical music, the odds were you had never heard it before and you were never going to hear it again. That's what the music was. So to those people, I say, great, go do that. (laughs) That there's There's nothing that says you can't make money on live performance. Because, in fact, if you view the Internet as radio, uh, and you have your own radio station, it would never have occurred to you to charge Oprah to be on her show. Never would occur to you to charge uh, a radio station to play your thing. You send them free music all the time. Well, the Internet is radio for your music, for your ideas. And if you get played everywhere, it'll take care of itself. You know, the thing about uh, the, the launch of CeeLo's song, which was just such a perfectly crafted pop hit, was really interesting to me because the video went viral before you could buy anything. You couldn't buy the, uh, it on iTunes. You couldn't buy it anywhere. Um, and I looked at that and I said, that must have been a mistake. But now I'm thinking it wasn't a mistake at all, that it basically enforced it going completely viral. couldn't be played on the radio. You couldn't buy it. You just had to share it. And the fact that the only way to share it was for free actually, I think, made it more likely it got shared. So the question is, is CeeLo worth more now or than he was six months ago? I think we can all argue he's making more money and happier and influencing more people now than he was six months ago. One of the the quotes I've heard you say that uh, I thought was very intriguing and kind of goes along the lines with what you were just talking about was that uh, you're in the business of spreading ideas, not selling stuff. How, do, how does that change how you go about um, creating the content you create and distributing it? Well, you know, so here, here's the thing from a musician's point of view. The, the problem musicians, pop musicians, used to solve is this. I go to Tower Records. I have a pop music problem. And my problem is I don't know what to listen to next. And so the guys at Rhino or Warner or wherever say, well, we've got a certain amount of shelf space. We've got to put stuff in that shelf space so that someone who comes in with that problem might buy what we put out this week. The new model is no one's ever going to hear of you unless the idea spreads. And if the idea spreads, it's not that hard to figure out ways to make money from it. So what you got to dream up when you go to sleep at night is what could I do tomorrow? What could I say tomorrow? How could I be a musician tomorrow in a way that's likely to spread? You know, so Jill Sobule is a wonderful person and she's been around a while And what Jill does is she's a great musician. And part of the reason she's a great musician is when people encounter her playing real good for free, as Joni would say, they sometimes stick and they turn around and they buy her CD, et cetera. But the point is Jill's trying to figure out how do I make lyrics? How do I perform? How do I do my work in a way that other people will tell each other about me? And much of the music that I encounter on CD Baby or on the net and other places is really quite fine. But it doesn't overwhelm me with the urge to spread it. And therefore, it's not great. What do you see artists doing that you would say is the wrong thing to do when trying to reach out to make those connections like you're talking about that makes them from being a decent artist to being a great artist. I know a lot of people will jump in trying to connect with an audience and just go about it all the wrong ways. What are some of those ways that are just the wrong ways? Well, I would say the biggest thing is compromising for the masses. That uh, everyone will never listen to what you make, ever. So stop trying. And instead of pleasing a million, figure out how to delight a thousand. 
and get back to your roots of what made you become a musician in the first place, right? That you, if you can't figure out how pleasing yourself also pleases your tribe, then you're never going to be happy as a musician. So you better start by overwhelmingly delighting yourself with the work you make, not because it fits in and not because people don't criticize it. In fact, seeking to be criticized by people who don't get the joke, because that's the goal. Not to be a Borscht Belt comedian, but to be the edgy one um, that people will travel across the country to listen to. You know, Jerry Seinfeld is the exception. He is not the rule. The rule, the, one, the model that really works is to be on the edge, not in the center. And I guess the second thing I would say is that uh, patience is key. That when we talk to people uh, who weren't the overnight one-hit wonders, but who are really professional musicians, they're patient at it. Um, the, that these people, uh, you know, I just heard this uh, jazz musician the other night, and she's been at it for 30 years, and now she, her tribe is showing up. Uh, that sucks. But that's the deal. I'm a musician as well, and as I get older, that's something that uh, I, I've grown to appreciate more and more, the idea that um, an artist who has put in the time and also it's just all about their personal passions because the idea of making it is long gone. And then it, at that point, it seems like what they create is even better than what they themselves may have even expected just because at that point they're just so focused on doing it for the love of it that something great comes out that, that then truly connects with other people. Right. I mean, here's the thing. There's 300 million people in this country. Only 10 million of them are going to spend money on music next year. So the other 290 million are dead to you, right? They're conduits, maybe, to help you reach the 10 million you need. But don't kill yourself to please these average-seeking uh, selfish folks in the middle, that they're just connectors that are going to connect you to the people who truly care about music, the people who are going to show up at the Stone uh, at 9 o'clock on a Sunday night to hear someone banging on the piano. Mm-hmm. That's the person who's going to support your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I've, uh quote I've heard you say is that uh, you don't need permission to lead people I think a lot of artists kind of sit around waiting for, like like you mentioned Pitchfork earlier, someone like Pitchfork or some sort of tastemaker to grant them the right to stand up and lead. That seems to be, you know, not the way of the, how the tribe works. Right. Well, I mean, my new book, Poke the Box, basically is a permission slip. It's 84 pages and says, okay, here's permission. If you've been waiting for it, I picked you. Now you may go. You know, that's a lot to get for your seven bucks, a permission slip. But what has happened in our culture is the masses sit around waiting for someone to stand up and say, follow me, right? They wait for someone like Rachel Maddow to stand up and say, this is what I believe. And then they go follow her, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. The masses don't come to you and say, please, please, please tell us where to go. They wait till they see someone's going somewhere and then they follow them. You mentioned your new book. I know you've got a new project out called The Domino Project. You want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that? Well, you know, I didn't want to keep being a hypocrite. Uh, I had been railing about the broken nature of book publishing for a long time. And so last August I announced I was done with traditional book publishing because uh, it's a lot like the music industry. So I started my own book publishing company. It's powered by Amazon. We're going to publish books by lots of different people. The first one's from me. Uh, And there's a lot of, you know, sort of inside publishing detail here, but the bottom line is uh, we've got different prices for different people. The book ranges from a 99-cent pre-order Kindle book to a $75 limited edition letterpress with a poster hand-signed book and everything in between. And what we are trying to do is make short books that are easy to spread. We sell them in a five-pack and a 50-pack, all because not because I want to dominate publishing, because I don't, but I want people in publishing to copy these ideas and figure out how to take them to the next level. Well, we'll definitely be watching what you do there. Do you have any uh, final words of advice for an artist who's out there trying to connect with a tribe and make a, a breakthrough with their music in today's current climate? I think you should be an artist. I think you should stop trying to be a business person and stop trying to please your mother in law. I think you should make the music you've always wanted to make because you're not going to get many chances. Uh, So you might as well make the thing you're proud of 
it's probably not going to sell. Uh, but the stuff in the middle isn't going to sell either. So make that thing you believe in. Uh, do it loud and do it proud. And hopefully the rest of the world will hear you. Well, that's good advice, Seth. I appreciate you uh, for being on the podcast. And uh, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Uh, go to Google and type in Domino or Domino Project or Poke the Box, and you'll find it. All right. We'll, we'll put, uh, I'll, I'll do that and put a link to uh, your blog on the podcast site, and um, we'll send some people over there to check out more. Thanks. I Thank- appreciate the good work you're doing. Oh, thanks, Seth. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks again to Seth for taking time out of his busy schedule to be on the podcast. I'll put links to Seth's blog in the podcast notes for this episode. You can find those at cdbabypodcast.com. He always has lots of great advice on his blog. There's usually a couple little postings a day, and they're quick and easy to digest, so it's not some overwhelming reading every day. It's definitely worth subscribing to. Like I mentioned at the top of the podcast, I have a special coupon code for CD Baby DIY Musician podcast listeners. Use coupon code PODCAST2011, that's PODCAST2011, and uh, get $7 off your new album submission to CD Baby. That will get your music on iTunes, CD Baby, and all the other digital retail sites. Plus, Plus, we'll warehouse your CD here in Portland and ship it worldwide for your music sales around the globe. We get a lot of questions when we give out coupon codes. Of, you know, what, what can I do? My album's not done, but it's on its, on its way. Uh, you can go ahead and sign up your album to take advantage of the offer. Just uh, sign up the album in your CD Baby account and pay for the submission. Use the coupon code and you'll be all set when you want to release the album. It'll be there ready for you. And uh, as always, we want to hear your feedback. So feel free to call our listener line at 206-426-5683. Email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com or just leave a comment on the show notes for this episode. If you're calling in, try to keep your comments brief and uh, that will help us get them on the show. We love sharing your calls, but if it starts getting longer than two minutes, it makes it hard for us to get it in there. And uh, that's going to do it for this episode. We'll catch you later. Bye. been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 